Big Noon Kickoff presents Bear Bets, and this is episode number one. I am excited finally to get going. The, the, the question I had asked the most during the offseason, Bear, you're at Fox now. Are you going to have a podcast? Are you going to have a column? When's the pod dropping? Well, I didn't know for sure when it was going to be because I knew I was going to be in Australia for the Women's World Cup, but I am back now. I am happy to be back now. College football season is here. I couldn't be more excited. And the goal here, have some fun, drop some knowledge, make it entertaining, make it informative, and give out bets that I am actually betting on. It's my own money as well. If I'm not confident enough to bet my own money on it, why should I be giving you something to say? You, you go ahead and bet it, but it's not good enough for me. I am here living every sweat with you, living every drop, fourth down pass, every third down stop, every penalty that gives a first and goal. I'm living it with you. So we're along for the ride. We're either winning together or losing together. And doing this pod together with me is the great Jeff Schwartz, my honorary co-captain here, my offensive lineman, my tackle, um, a fellow, fellow betting enthusiast, uh, a, a fellow uh, big guy like me. We love each other. We have a great uh, rapport on Twitter, and we've gotten together as well. And we're looking forward to sharing the sharing the knowledge and making you guys some money this year. Jeff, what's up, brother? I am thrilled to be here. I'm honored to be here. And as you mentioned, man, the best part about this podcast is we obviously love wagering. We love gambling. We're, we're giving you wagers that we actually make. I think that's important in this business, right? To, to, to have skin in the game, to sweat these things out. And we're going to start sweating on Thursday, and we're going to do it on Friday, and we're going to do it on Saturday. And on Sunday this week, we've got four days of college football in the first weekend, Bear. I'm so excited to do this with you. Well, we, we might even be sweating some bets right now while we're recording this first episode. <laughs> you, 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 just joking, we, we might be. Who knows? Bear, Bear dabbles in the tennis, folks. He dabbles in everything. I, I am impressed with your wide range of uh, of, uh, of sports you like to wager on. It's always impressed me um, to see the, the the tennis knowledge you have, the, the the table tennis knowledge you have, the volleyball, everything you do, you gamble on, and you really do it yourself, and it's fantastic. And, and something that basically everyone gambles on is the most popular sport in the world, I think, to gamble on, or at least the U.S., is the – should, should I go to the national football? Should I say it like that? Or I'll just say, no, just the NFL. And that starts next week. And next week we will have an edition of bear bets solely focusing on the NFL, which I'm really looking forward to because I always had some NFL bets and ideas that I'd like to voice in the past, but it just didn't necessarily have uh, the podcast platform to do it. Now we do. And I've got somebody who's played at the highest level as well. So I, I'm really looking forward to a, uh, picking your brain next week once we get into the NFL. I think you've got a lot to offer in, in terms of you've been in a player's shit. What does a short week really do? Does it really bother you? Uh, what's the worst weather to play in, rain or snow or cold or heat? Like, I, I think your experiences are really going to help a lot of us out. Bear, it's wind. Wind is the number one factor you wager on in weather. It's not, it's not the cold. It's not the heat. It's not the rain. It's wind. When it's windy, take the under. I mean, they take the under. You can't throw the ball in the wind. People don't get that. It's the wind bears the problem. Nothing else as a player. Well, you say the wind is bad to play in. Is the wind bad to attend a game in? And more importantly, when you're attending, if you're attending a game, are you more likely or less likely to <laughs> wager on that game? So the reason we're not in studio for this first one is I'm going to Oregon this weekend. I'm a former Oregon Duck. I'm going to watch Oregon play Portland State this weekend on Saturday. Taking my kids. I'm so excited for that. My daughter has never been. Awesome. My son hasn't been in four years. Like, we're excited. It's a day game. The weather's going to be fantastic. And I have to make a decision. I have no wager on this game yet. But I kind of don't like to wager on games I'm at when I'm rooting for the team, right? Whether I'm an Oregon game, I'm a Lakers fan, I'm a Giants baseball fan, I'm a Chiefs, uh, a, a Chiefs football fan. I'm not, I'm not rooting, I'm not wait, rooting for the team and also rooting for a wager. That's too much capacity for me. My, I can't do that. But bear, if I attend a game with no rooting interest, like the Charlotte Hornets basketball games I attend with my son <laughs> here in North Carolina, I will 1,000 percent wager on those games because they are boring and wagering makes it way more fun. So games I te teams I cheer for, like Chiefs Super Bowl against the Niners, no wager. Oregon game this weekend, no wager. Just want to enjoy it. But the Hornets game, anything I'm at where I'm just going as, as, a, as a spectator, a baseball game I'm at, absolutely, I'll put money on it. 
Uh, a, a little birdie has told me that you're going to be enjoying that game as a uh, as an honorary captain this week. Is that is that the I, correct? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I can't decide if they gave that to me because I'm just going to be in town, or they really like me. I mean, I do promote Oregon a lot on, <laughs> on social media, but I'm glad to do it because look, here's the deal. Well, you know, my kids are are at the age now where they like sports more, and they didn't see me play football, right? And so I think for my son to see me go to you know to be a captain here to walk on the field, I'm gonna try to sneak him on the field with me to for that coin toss will be super cool for them. I'm excited for this Oregon season, um, but again, I'm 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 not wagering this game, but I I am I'm excited to go back. It's like going back home, taking my kids, showing them where I I went to school. So uh, a lot of fun with that game, and I, I can't wait to be there. It's early enough Saturday where I get to watch the rest of the games, including our first game for bear bets here your first game that you like to wager on here we're going to go through this each and every day we have a podcast college nfl your favorite wagers we're calling them bear bets and i'm going to go over details and here's the best part guys bears wagering these again i keep i'm going to reference this many times bear is wagering on these wagers i might dabble in this as well because i like to tail them at times we're starting with another game in the pacific northwest boise state at Washington, Boise State is a Mountain West favorite right now. Washington coming off a great season in Kalen DeBoer's first year. The number here is Washington minus 14. The total is 58 and a half. Bear, where are you leaning, buddy? I love the Huskies in this game, laying lay the 14 against Boise. This is not, I don't think, a, one of those vintage Boise teams. Like if you go back in the, the last nine games, which I think it goes back to 2016 or so, Boise's two and seven against power five teams and five of those losses are by at least 17 points. I, I just think the matchup is bad for Boise. I, this is primarily a run based offense with, 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 with an offensive line. That's pretty experienced and Halani at running back. I don't think that's going to bode well against the UW defensive front that, that I think is it got better last year because they played a little bit more complimentary football to, to help keep that defense off the field. And again, I normally don't like buying into these very hype teams early in the year. Look, I, I was on UW over last year when I think the, the win total was seven and a half or so, and they went over with flying colors. But this year, they're, you're asking them to win 10, and it's a lot. It's basically go out and do it again now. But I think the situation here being that Boise gets so much run up in there in the Pacific Northwest. The ties between the school with Peterson formally uh, coaching it, but it, it, both of them panics, I think will come out and really give him with, with a pretty good group of wide receivers. I think he tries and gets a, uh, his name in that, in that Heisman discussion early on. Again, I don't like the matchup for Boise. I think UW comes out here and puts a number up on the Broncos and I like them laying the 14. I despise Washington. So it hurts me to say this, <laughs> but I agree with you here. This number, I think, is wrong. This number should be 17 to 20. I think it's way too low for, as you mentioned, a Washington team that has multiple first-rounders at important positions, quarterback, left tackle, pass rusher, wide receiver. Look, do you buy into the 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 tailing green kind of year two in the Boise offense, Avalos with the defense? They lost some players, but can you coach? Like, or do you buy into any of the Mountain West favorite hype for Boise? Maybe that keeps them in this game. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I buy into the Mountain West favorite hype because I think the Mountain West is down. It's not what we've normally seen. I just don't know if, yes, he played better at the end of the year. I don't know if they have the game breakers at receiver to really go out and, and challenge that Washington defense, which gave up some big plays last year. But I don't say, I, I don't I don't think their skill players are what we, we were used to seeing in their in their heyday when when, when Pete was there and they were in the BCS every year. So. Yeah, I'm 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 liking UW uh, quite a bit in this game. Uh, hurts my heart, but I agree with you there, buddy. Let's get to your <laughs> second wager for your bear bets. This is South Alabama off a 10 and three season last year. They're returning their leading passer, rusher, and receiver. They're at Tulane. Tulane last year off a Cotton Bowl victory against USC. 11 wins last year. They're favored by six and a half, and the total in this is 52. Bear, where are you leaning in week two? This is a very dangerous game for Tulane. You're coming off of that college football playoff or New Year's Six, I should say, miraculous comeback win against USC. And now you don't have Tajay Spears. You don't have you have Dorian Williams, a linebacker. You don't have Dick Anderson, the other linebacker. You got a South Alabama team coming off a 10-win season. Like I said, you've got eight, like 18 starters back. 
Give me South Alabama, the Jaguars, plus the six and a half in this game. I think the Jags have an excellent chance to win this game outright. Like they, 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 they need to capitalize on this window because I don't know how long this coaching staff is going to be together. Kane Walmack, um, head coach, Major Rappel White's their offensive coordinator. I, they, they, this is a, a scary game for, for, for Tulane. Like South Alabama's losses last year were by a point at UCLA in a game they very easily could have won. And then they lost like a 10-6 game or something like that to Troy, which wound up winning the Sun Belt. So those were their regular season losses last year. That's how close they were last year to having an undefeated regular season. So give me South Alabama plus the points, and I'll uh, sprinkle a uh, part of a unit there on the money line as well. By the way, uh, not only Tulane better be careful so this weekend, Oklahoma State better be careful in a couple of weeks as well. Ooh. Oh, okay. I like that one. A, a, a little preview looking ahead here. You mentioned, right, South Alabama last year should have won in the Rose Bowl. They should have beat UCLA. A really weird fourth down call cost them an opportunity to beat the Bruins, a nine-win Bruin team last season. You mentioned something uh, interesting there. Uh, 18 returning production players for South Alabama out of their 22. How much do you look at returning production in your week one handicapping? I look at it quite a bit because I think it shows – that you've got a lot of continuity back, a lot of players who are used to playing together, that where, where defensive signals, you, you, you know that these guys are where they suppo- are supposed to be. You could make a late change and trust them. There are a lot of times a quarterback wide receiver connection, like you know the, uh, the hot routes, you know where wide receivers are going to be. You're just a lot more comfortable, I think, playing with, with, with a bunch of guys that you've played before. That's why I'm comfortable doing this show with you because you and I have had great discussions for the, oh, for the last few years, and I'm, 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 co- I'm, co- I'm comfortable giving you a hard time just like you're comfortable giving me a hard time. Oh, I love it. Look at us getting along so well in our first episode. Uh, Getting along so well will have to be Alabama's quarterbacks because our next game is your third game here for your bear bets. It's Middle Tennessee at Alabama. Alabama right now will not announce a quarterback. Uh, We know they're a very talented team, but we don't know what's happening in quarterback. They're favored by 39 here over Middle Tennessee. The total is 51 and a half. So they're expecting this game to be a a struggle for, for Middle Tennessee to score some points here, Bear, where you're leaning. And it probably will be a struggle for Middle Tennessee to score some points because they're they're a better defensive team than they are offensive. But if they can score seven, I think they have an excellent chance to cover. So I'm going to take the Blue Raiders plus the 39 at Bryant Denny week one. And you mentioned Alabama's quarterback situation. It's a tough spot for Tommy Reese and, and, and Nick Saban in this first game. If you've got three guys Publicly, you're saying you don't know who, who it is and who ultimately you're going to play or start. So you're probably going to play all three guys. You really, you really can't not show anything in your playbook because you need to see who's going to excel in certain situations. But at the same time, you don't want to show everything because you have Texas next week coming in and you don't want to give the Longhorns any kind of film advantage and any, any type of scouting report that way. They they know what's coming, so it's a very tough spot, I think, for for Nick and Tommy to what plays are we going to call, who are we going to play, for how long, and if you go back and look historically, now there just may have been massive talent differences where Alabama couldn't help but win fifty five three, but at the same time, he doesn't normally like to run the score up on these overmatched teams, so. 45-7, I think, would uh, would, would treat me perfectly. And I can see with the total around 51, that's kind of what the odds makers are expecting. You find it silly when these coaches can't announce any depth chart. Nick Saban refused to put out a depth it's chart dumb. for this game. It's it's dumb, right? Like, it doesn't matter. It's not going to change what happens to Middle Tennessee. I don't get it, Bear. It makes no sense. I want to fade those it teams did. whenever I say that happened. And, and, and it's like the, the Utah-Florida game tonight, earlier in the week, oh, Cam Rising is atop the depth chart, and people all say, so, oh, Cam Rising is going to play. <laughs> Never play. It, it, it's, it's chicanery. <laughs> it, it, we, we know, we've known for months that Cam Rising is not playing tonight. So and people, people, people need to uh, take that information with a grain of salt. So do you think Bama plays two or three quarterbacks? Because your point about the rotation, especially with Texas coming up, next week is a, is a pretty good point, right? Cause it look as it's a former lineman. Like you, you want to work with one guy. You want to get in that rhythm. You want him to see the same things you see. And when you rotate so many quarterbacks, you don't get that together. You don't get that cohesion together. And then you have to go play Texas in, in two weeks and Texas is good. And so I think Nick, Nick Saban is going to try. I, I don't know if you agree bear to 
limit reps. Like I think he's going to try to get one guy a half, another guy a half maybe, and maybe has to work a different way. But I would imagine he doesn't want to go three ways in this game or two ways in this game. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would think that you'd probably have it in some kind of order where Milrow and Re and uh, and Buckner probably get equal snaps, and maybe you bring in uh, Simpson kind of late to give him a drive just to get his his feet wet. Because because I, I think you're right. Because not only are they undecided there, they're a young team throughout with a lot of young skill players around there. So like it's going to be. I, I think as the year goes on, we're probably going to see more of a. Uh, a classic Nick Saban classic offense where maybe they're a little bit more run oriented and maybe they're relying a bit more on that defense as well. How much is the new clock rules, which we know change in college football, right? They're running the clock now in first down for 56 of the minutes, kind of look at, at the big underdog and say, Hey man, if, if Alabama runs the football enough, the clock just kind of bleeds out. Are you taking that in consideration at all? Any of your wagers early in the season? I, I am taking, I'm erring on that side, assuming that, these games will be lower scoring and that there will be fewer yeah. plays. I think what, what is it? We're expecting what, like seven, seven fewer plays. I think is yeah. what the, the, the average was like the expect. And that's that, that, that could be a, a yeah. touchdown a game. Who knows? But, but I think until we know for sure, I, I think you do need to go into it and say, okay, it will be a fewer points. Score, but at the same time, I think the odds makers know that as well. And they're probably baking that into their lines. I would imagine so. Let's get your, your last game here. Uh, it's a battle between Fresno State and Purdue. Both teams go with transfer quarterbacks. A new coach for Purdue and, and, and Ryan Walters, longtime coach Jeff, Jeff Tedford still at Fresno. Purdue's here by three and a half. The total is 47 and a half. And Bear, I think you're going against your favorite play last year, which was taking the Fresno State Bulldogs. And Jake Hayner, your boy, Jake Hayner has gone. I say Jake Hayner is gone. I can no longer play Fresno State. But by the way, I cannot wait until he actually starts in the NFL and 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 and, and we can pat each other on the back just because being the honorary members of the Jake Hayner fan club for years. But I think this line move has gone too far. I, I, I get maybe taking Fresno State at six and a half or seven where this line was earlier on this summer. But here at three and a half, I'm going to lay the points with Purdue. Okay, this is not a Purdue team that is close to as talented as the team was last year, the one that got to the Big Ten championship game. Rahm is gone. Connell is gone. All the most of your skill players are gone. But at the same time, you mentioned Ryan Walters. I think he will come in and sure up that defense. And Graham Harrell comes in to, to call the offense. And he's brought in Hudson Card from, from Texas, who is familiar with Harrell's kind of formations and, and that type of offense. And I think he's going to flourish in this offense, finally getting an opportunity. Even shorthanded, I think Purdue will find a way in that offense to put up some points on a, a pretty good Fresno defense. But at the same time, you, you hit on, on Harrell. Not, not Harrell, I should say Hayner, the other quarterback with an H in, in this game. But Hayner not being there. But he's not only is he not there, Mims and some of the other guys that were on that Fresno offense last year, they are gone too. So I could see this potentially being a lower scoring game. And I think because of that, I'm going to lay the points with Purdue because I think they probably have better overall talent on the defensive side of the ball. And I think they have more ways to score points with a pretty uh, creative Harrell calling the plays. Does it matter to you at all that you have a first-time coach at Purdue and then a long-time coach in Jeff Tefford? Or is this, or this really just about the talent on both teams? It's more about the line move than anything else for me. I, I'm reading this as a discount on Purdue. A anytime you see a big move on a trendy underdog like this, I think at some point there's a there, there's a, the line where you have to say, okay, at this point, there's too much value. It's kind of like the re it's closing line value basically in reverse where I'm, I'm going to take the favorite a at a reduced price uh, against where the line the line opened. But but that makes that's a good point that you make with with, with Tedford, a guy being around. Uh, against the head coach making his uh that, that is not an angle that i that i thought of that is not something that i thought about when handicapping this game so now you're giving me something to think about but i still am going to take purdue what do you what do you feel about about buying points would you buy a half point down to three here or leave it at three now because i just i hate laying three and a half and especially in the nfl I, I would almost never lay three and a half in the nfl but in college football there's a little more leeway but does that three and a half scare you that hook seems to always bite me in the butt man 
I think with so many two point conversions now, it's lessened. It's interesting because you always say you're worried about laying three and a half. And I've had multiple conversations with Chris Andrews, uh, the great bookmaker over at the South Point. And, and I, I said to him, like, why, why does it feel like three and a half, like play the, play the fit in two and a half? And, and he said, I'm like, he's like, you're right. It's counterintuitive. Lay the three and a half, take the two and a half, and more often than not, uh, you, you, you're, you're going to be right. Because I think the majority of people think exactly the opposite. Like, oh, you're saying if the, you lay the two and a half and you win by a field goal, then then, then you win. Or, okay, you you, 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 take, you take the three and a half and you, and you lose by a field goal, you win. So it, it feels kind of obvious, for lack of a better word, that that's the way you should play it, which is why I think the counterintuitive, the way you wouldn't think to play it is probably the way that you should. All right, Bear, let's recap your four wagers right now. You have Washington favored by 14, hosting Boise State. You're taking the underdog South Alabama at Tulane, plus six and a half for South Alabama. Middle Tennessee, the Blue Raiders at Alabama. Middle Tennessee is getting 39 points. You're taking them to, to, to cover the 39. Then Fresno State at Purdue taking the Boilermakers minus the three and a half. I, I, I see, I see a PU there. I, ho I hope that's not a uh, like PU. Like these picks stink. I hope that's not a uh, a, a declaration on what, what the what, what everybody thinks of these picks for this week. And I hope they don't PU. That's for sure. I hope they the are UP up, up up up. They're, well, you're you're you're, you're you're laying the three and a half. They're PU in for that man. Is uh, even though Chris Andrews might <laughs> might disagree with you. Um, all right. Next up, we have the gambling group chat. We're going to be joined by Sammy P and Will Hill and talk everything to do with gambling, wagering on the college football games this weekend as we see fit. You're really going to enjoy this segment. We're going to do it each and every podcast, NFL and college football. And again, these are wagers the four of us have put down ourselves. That's coming up next. Now it's time for what I think is going to be everybody's favorite segment of the week. I know it's going to be my favorite segment of the week. We all have our little group text friends that we get and share information, share bets, bust shops, and this show is going to be no different. I got three of my guys with me. Jeff is obviously back in here, and we're going to be joined by Sam Panianovich from Fox Sports, amongst other things, Will Hill from VEASAN and a bunch of other spots. We all share information throughout the offseason. It is no longer the offseason. We are ready for week one. Can't wait to get going. So the first question I'm going to bring up here is, Everyone wants to know, who is your Heisman pick? It's so easy to take Caleb Williams, right? I'll, I'll, I'll start with Jeff being that you're the only one of us five people that actually played college football. What, what, what do you think? Do you go back? I, know, I know your love affair for USC and uh, yeah. Caleb Williams winning the Heisman last year. So I know, I know you're all over Caleb to win it again this year, right? Yeah, big USC fan over here, Jeff Schwartz. Um, I don't think he's going to win the Heisman, not because he's not the best player in college football. We saw on Saturday how good he can be, right? We know he's the really the entire offense. The offensive line struggled. Uh, there's some wide receiver, I think, trying to find guys open. He's the offense. He's the best player in college football. There's no doubt about that. Number one pick in the draft, but he's not going to win two years in a row. First of all, we know this, right? The voters typically don't want to vote in guys two years in a row. Haven't done it since 1975. But, but more importantly, guys, I don't think USC is going to have the season they had last season. They're not surprising anyone, which you saw last year, right? Going from four and eight all the way to, to 11 wins. And they're not going to win the Pac-12 conference. And those two things are really going to hurt his oh, husband. Oh, 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 they're, they're going not to find going ways. to, not going to, not going to, I, I have to stop you there. Not going to win the Pac-12. We, 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 are we going, uh, we going UW there? We're, we're, How are you going to win the oh, Pac-12 oh, if you on. can't tackle anybody, they, Bear? They can't tackle. They just gave up 400 yards to San Jose State. How are they going to beat Washington and Utah and Oregon? Forget it. Sammy is correct. It, 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 it's true because if they don't get the turnover luck that they got left, it was amazing how they were winning games last year with, with all with, with the, the, the kickball interception. Oh wow, look at that! <laughs> uh, uh, what should have been should have been a touchdown pass. Whoop! Let me let me run it back for a pick six the other way. I kind of agree with you. I, I don't think they're going to win the Pac-12. They're not. Oregon's going to win. We anyway. get to to to, to that another time. Oh, we'll get um, to that. I, Will, I Will, we have a wheel. I'm sorry. Go finish, finish your thought and then I'll get to Will. I'll say I, I'm going to go start Monday night with with uh, the Jordan Travis uh, Heisman campaign after they uh -huh. win on, on Sunday against LSU. I, I'm going with him as my lead dog to win this one. I think he's got everything you want in a Heisman quarterback. He plays in that in that offense with all those wide receivers and Mike Norvell that can coach offense. I'm going with Jordan Travis. 
Jeff, I don't know how far you are away from me. I don't know how you could possibly see my notes from there, but I'm totally with you. Not too often in college football do you get a showcase game, a standalone game where you're the only game on, and you get that Sunday night with Jordan Travis. And you know, like you mentioned with Caleb Williams, when you're betting Heisman, you're betting the program, you're betting the team. And not only has Travis improved every year just exponentially, but he's got a, an outstanding coach in Norvell. They've got good receivers. They've got a ton of offensive line experience, which I know you know you value. Uh, greatly so I think Travis at what 12 to 1 14 to 1 of course shop around that was my pick too that's one look you know, everyone wants to be fun and find the guy that's 80 to 1 90 to 1 I've heard people make a pace for you know Tanner Mordecai with Wisconsin's new offense but to me Travis I, I think is a really good bet all right, I mean, all right, so, look, all right Sammy yeah. we'll, 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 we'll mention something there with that game uh, Sammy on Sunday night but what, what about the other like J.J. Daniels if he has a big game there is that same poll true for him like it would Travis yeah, whoever wins that game is going to obviously catapult atop the other one. But there, there's too many quarterbacks for me, boys. I mean, in the drop-off between Caleb Williams and Drake May and Michael Penix and Quinn Ewers and all these guys, Jordan Travis, Jalen Daniels at Kansas, like they're all very good, and I could make a case for all of them. So let me go to a different position here. I know, I know, it's always a quarterback that wins the Heisman Trophy. Not really, though. Shouldn't be. Marvin Harrison Jr. is the best player to me in college football. And if we're talking numbers – how about 30 to one on a guy who's substantially better than the next best receiver, a guy who's probably going to get a hundred catches for 20 touchdowns this year on an Ohio state team that could run the table and go 12 and 0. And here's the other thing. Last year, they had CJ Stroud who spread the ball around this year. Whoever ends up winning the job by week two or three is going to literally play Madden the entire game and just throw the ball to Harrison who always gets open, who can make any catch, run any route. And I bet 30 to one, there's no way that Caleb Williams should be five to one. And Marvin Harrison should be 30 to one. That that does not that does not even compute in my brain. No, no, and you mentioned something I think important right there in terms of the quarterback position. They don't have like a Heisman caliber quarterback like Stroud was last year. He was gonna get a ton of votes, obviously, in the Heisman voting, and that was gonna take away from a, any other vote getter. And like Harrison is going to be the guy. He is going to be the Ohio State, the face of Ohio State's Heisman campaign. So I agree with you. Like Harrison's a great play. You did also mention a bunch of quarterbacks and how the quarterbacks are deep. I went way down. And Will, I know you're, you talked about 80, 85 to one. You don't want any of, any of that. But uh, I actually took Connor Wegman at 60 to one, uh, Texas A&M's quarterback. He's down to 40 to one. And I'm assuming a lot of people are seeing the same thing I am. Now, you have a, a, an offense now that's got some skill players back. They got Bobby Petrino in who's now as a coordinator calling plays. They've kind of been running in the Stone Age a little bit with some of the Jimbo Fisher schemes and slow developing things. Remember, Petrino took Lamar Jackson and that Louisville team to a great season, got Lamar the Heisman Trophy. I think Wigman now in his second year as a starting quarterback is someone at A&M this, this might be the year that AM finally realizes its potential. Like they, they've been hyped the last couple of years, but they finally have built up a couple of recruiting classes. Jimbo made some changes on the staff that are important. So uh the high bet in the Heisman's kind of like betting it. Like you're looking for a price. Maybe Wegman won't win it, but I would expect his price to come down, and maybe it allows you an opportunity to bet on a couple of other guys as well. So another season-long bet that we like to get into. Favorite season win total of the year. I started with Jeff last time. Let's start with Sammy this time. Anything out there catch your eye? Yeah, you can still find Buffalo over six at a couple shops, and the price disp discrepancy, rather, is minus 105 to plus 15. So always get the best number, of course. You know, Toledo gets a lot of love because they have all the talent in the MAC, but mm -hmm. Maurice Linguist is a third-year coach, and he is surprisingly and sort of quietly brought in two of the top talented classes in the Mac. And as you know, Bear, talent is sometimes more than half the battle in the Mac. You know, <laughs> this team was awful two years ago because Lance brought everybody to Kansas, but Mo has had time to bring guys in. They have Cole Snyder back at quarterback who transferred from Rutgers. Their defense is always good. If they can run the football with success, I think Buffalo can win eight or nine games in a very down Mac this year. So I'm very, very bullish, no pun intended, on the Buffalo Bulls over six. I, I am still having horrible flashbacks to, I think it was 2019, where I had a beautiful preseason ticket on Buffalo to win the MAC, and they wound up blowing a big lead and lost in the MAC championship game. That, that one hurt quite a bit. Will, what do you got for us in the win total frontier? 
I hate to even go there, but it is a betting show. I just think Mississippi State under is a good bet. And, you know, he was such Leach was such a good character for the game. He was so funny, so quirky. And, you know, from a football standpoint, we were finally going to get to see what he was like with the with with big time athletes. Uh, I, I think we're, this was going to be a big year for him. Now you're going to transition to a younger coach, a defensive coach. The offensive line is going to have to change how they block. That's not a great defensive team. It's a tough schedule. There's some sixes. There's some six and a halfs that are juiced. I just think it's going to be hard for this team to get to seven wins to beat you. So, uh, look, I, I'm on under Mississippi State. It's just it's a shame. It's so bad for the game. But look, from a betting standpoint, I think Mississippi State under is a good bet. And you're, you're right. You look at the schedules front loaded. Arizona, who I think is going to be better this year, LSU at South Carolina, and then Alabama. That's you're you're potentially. I mean, you should beat Southeastern Louisiana week one. So you're probably looking at two and three best case after five games. So you're probably onto something there. All right. Besides Oregon over, what are you looking at, Jeff? <laughs> um, I'm going to go with a, a, a Pac-12 team here. Stanford's win total, guys, like two and a half, three. And they have Hawaii and Sac State on their calendar. Vegas is telling you they're going to be very bad, and they're going to be very, very bad. They will not be favored in an entire game this, this, this season. Troy Taylor, brand new coach, I like what he's doing with the program. They have no talent, guys. They have no game records. They have no sports <laughs> players on offense. Like They're just a bad football team, and that's okay. You have a bad football team. He's recruiting well. 2024 will be better. We know, look, they can't retool in the in the portal like most can but are offering the NIL opportunities that most can so it takes time to build that roster but they're going to lose to Hawaii this weekend I hope they beat Sac State and they're not going to be favored in a single game the rest of the season and they have a tough kind of Pac-12 North schedule because they really haven't realigned that yet so guys I, I know it's boring maybe to take Stanford under two and a half but they're going to go two and ten at the best Hey, Bear, how about this? From a numbers numbers standpoint, I've got Stanford actually two points worse than Northern Illinois from a power rating standpoint. I've got NIU at a 90. Husky Husky with an IE. (laughs) Sorry, that's just the reality. They they are not good. They don't have any talent. Forget it. Is that line move well, this week too much? I mean, it was 10, it was seven. Now it's three and a half. That's usually not a good way to do it. If you take you know, three and a half when you could add 10, what do you guys think about the, uh, the game this week? I, I, I might be interested there. staying up a little late and maybe in the buy low situation. You, you know, our, our mutual friend there, a very prominent, better Steve, Steve Fezzik. He has a, a theory out there with where the bridge too far, where ultimately the line moves a little bit too far one way. And there's an opportunity to buy back, there might be an opportunity for that with the uh, with the Utah Florida game tonight as well. All right, I, we all have bet these season win totals. My favorite season win total that I have bet, and I'd like to get your opinion on it as well as LSU under nine and a half. So I am hoping that Will Hill is correct. The Florida State does win on on Sunday night, but I look at LSU and the way they won some games last year, kind of snuck up on Alabama. The first five games of the year. You've got Florida State, Ole Miss, and Mississippi State away from home. That doesn't include the road trip to a revenge-minded Alabama and Texas A&M, who I've already mentioned. I like the Aggies this year. Like, I, I think LSU could be anywhere from ten and two to seven and five. And I think if nine, nine and a half, that takes ten to beat me. I, I, I like that bet because I, I just wonder defensively, they bring in a bunch of new guys. They have a lot of secondary issues. I, I think they have some issues on the in the running back room now as well early in the year from what I maybe some some injuries that, that might uh, have not fully healed up by the time they take the field on Sunday night. So I, I think Florida State might be worth a play on Sunday, but I but I do think LSU is probably more of the nine and three, eight and four team than the than an eleven and one, ten and two national title contender. So, buy you Bengals under nine and a half, yay or nay? What say you guys? If Jaden Daniels takes that next step, guys, and he becomes the quarterback that people thought he would be as a true freshman playing at Arizona State now four years ago, if he takes that next step, they're going over this, right? So this is kind of a wager on on Jaden Daniels. If he stays who he is or doesn't get any better, they're going to definitely go under. But if he becomes a Heisman hopeful, which I'm not quite sure he's going to be, I think they can get over the nine and a half. I don't feel great about it, but to me, this is a wager just solely on if a quarterback becomes a superstar or just stays what he is. If Alabama is better in the West, you know, that's probably a game that they're going to have to win uh, to keep LSU under nine and a half. But I mean, I I texted you earlier, Baron. I didn't even know you had under LSU. I I took under nine and a half at minus one Oh five. 
not to be completely contrarian, but you, you get all these emails from all these sports books and it's like, hey, the most liable we are on the SEC title is LSU. Yep. <laughs> and the most popular SEC win total is LSU because they were so good last year. And if the quarterback is better this year, they might do it. They might, but... I mean, there are a lot of landmines on that schedule, and Brian Kelly got really lucky down the stretch in a lot of games last year. There were three games that could have gone either way. They win all three of them. Does that happen again in the SEC? I don't know. Uh, I'm willing to bet under, though, because it's a short of Brian Kelly, and they have some issues in the backfield. They're on, like, running back three or four right now. I've been told the wide receivers aren't great, so quarterback needs help. You know, he's not the greatest quarterback in the country right now, so I'm under nine and a half, too, but – there's a lot of contrarian vibes for me, per usual. Yeah, Speaking of popular I, I, bets. Go ahead, Walt. Yeah. Sorry. No, I was going to say, directionally, I agree with you guys. Ball bounced their way last year, where if it doesn't, one, of the, one or two of those games go a different way. We feel differently about them. Just devil's advocate, they are returning a lot of continuity. I mean, head coach, both coordinators, quarterback. There's not a lot of teams in the country in this era where everybody's moving everywhere. There's not a lot of teams that could say that. So it uh, would lean under, but not a bet for me. I, I was going to say, speaking of popular bets, Nothing is more popular than Colorado these days. All these, I don't, I, I probably shouldn't say idiots, <laughs> but all of these people betting Colorado to win the Pac-12 or maybe win with, like, what do, what do, what do you do? And their win total is three and a half. Now, look, this could go really poorly or it could be okay. Like it's, it's never been done before. Not only are you revamping the entire roster, you're revamping the entire coaching staff. Usually it's coaching staff comes in, he's got some players and maybe there'll be a run a couple of, but he ran the basically the entire team off after spring drills. So their win total is three and a half. I mean, if I had to play it, I would go under. Are, are you guys uh, under or over on, uh, on Colorado this year? What do you, what do you, what do you guys think? Bear, let me tell you, I almost drove to Colorado because I didn't have the ability to fly. I almost drove when they first hung a five on Colorado. <laughs> this is back in May. And I think it was, I don't even remember the book. It was under five at like minus 130. I almost got in the car and drove. It would have taken me three days to get there. <laughs> but I was going to do my damnness to bet under five. And now you got some books as low as three with uh, plus money to the over. I just... Dion has to be an A or an A plus coach to make this thing work this year, because this is not Jackson state. This is Colorado. This is a power conference. His offensive line is in shambles. His defensive line stinks. You know, I had a scout tell me the other day, don't be surprised if TCU runs for 400 yards this weekend, which is very possible. This is the time also boys to get Dion to kick Dion when he's done. I know Sonny Dykes does not like Dion. And if he can win that game by 50, he will. I think that sentiment is very popular amongst the coaches in the conference. Yes. Let's get Dion now. Let's get him now. Sammy, you made the point that I think matters the most here, guys. When you watch the highlight videos that Colorado, that Colorado puts out, like they're fun to watch, right? So Jerry Sanders, I think, will play well this year. Travis Hunter is a great talent. But watch a little closer at the offensive defensive lines. The defensive line looks tiny, and the offensive line can't block anyone. Every video, Sanders is running for his life. And the reports are true. Sammy is right. The offensive line and defensive line are going to struggle this season. And you're playing a conference where you have to rush the passer. You play Washington. You play Oregon. You, 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 you play Utah. You play USC. You play Washington State. You play Arizona. Like, all these high-powered offenses with – got to rush the passer. On the flip side, you got to protect your quarterback. And right now, their offensive line is not good enough. They have 41 new players, and they're too deep. 41 new players. They'll have to come together – Play as one group. What happens when all the guys who transferred and thinking they're going to play don't play? Are they moping now? Are they sulking? Are they playing their way out? Like, there's a lot of moving parts here, guys. I would lean under here, especially early in the season. If they go two and three to start, one and four to start, how's the attitude on the team? Here's the important thing I want to say. Bear is supposed to be my friend. Bear has my phone number. So when there's five and a halfs out there, four and a halfs, I, I'm looking at my phone right now. I never got a text. I never got a phone call. Hey, bet this. I was I out know, of the like, country when these fives and fives and a half. Like, I, I, I oh, was wow. an I was out of the is. country oh, wow. when five and five and a half came out. I was and, and then I'm, I'm I, I came back and I was begging for it to to go back. Like, give me four, just give me four. That way I can push on four and I won't lose and, and it never came back to four. So I'm naked on Colorado right now, but there might be an opportunity to, uh, to make some money game by game. All right, one more last thing here for, for the group. A nice little game I like to play, Would You Rather. Man, I always like to find a nice little stink bomb of a game or two stink bombs of a game and make you take one or the other. So week one, Would You Rather. Would you rather 
lay 10 with Temple against Akron, or would you rather lay six and a half with the State University of New Jersey against Northwestern? Two beautiful games this weekend. Uh, I'd rather lay with Rutgers, right? I mean, Northwestern has a brand new everything, and they they didn't win a game on U.S. soil last season, and they have a new coach (laughs) going through turmoil. Like, I'd rather do Rutgers. I don't feel great about it, but if you're asking me what I'd rather, I'd rather – Take Rutgers, we said minus the six against Northwestern. Six and a half. Uh, future yep. uh, future uh, Big Ten opponents of Oregon. Can't wait. <laughs> by the by the way, that's like an NFL total. Total's 39. It feels like <laughs> Bears, Bears, Packers on a on like a December Sunday afternoon. Is, is snow in the forecast this Saturday? 39. My goodness. 39. The banks of the the banks of the Raritan. All right, well, uh, Colorado had a lot of roster turnover. I don't think we're going to have a lot of roster turnover for next week. Great great catching up with each of you. We'll uh, we'll do it again soon. That group track segment, Bear, is going to be one of my favorite. We do each and every episode. I I love the wide range of of Heisman uh, thoughts there, right? We have some Jordan Travis, and then we also have, you know, some 60 to 1, some 30 to 1, and Sammy's always great with that value, and so are you. So that's a lot for the listeners to digest. I I think it's a good broad spectrum of, of outcomes that can happen. It, it is because like like we kind of alluded to it. It's too easy to try and pick Caleb Williams, and I think you laid out a great argument why I don't think they will vote him uh, to be the Heisman winner again. With with if there's long as there are some other real legitimate options out there, um, and, and what when was the last time that, that the preseason favorite actually won this award? I don't, I don't think Bryce was favored uh, last year. Was he? he? Wasn't. So, no, uh, it's yeah, I, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think it's funny. I remember the year Lamar won, and, and I mentioned uh, Bobby Petrino and Lamar earlier in the show. The year Lamar won the Heisman, I was out at West, the Westgate Superbook, and I liked Louisville that year. I liked them to win the ACC and reach the college football playoff. And, of course, if Louisville was going to win the ACC and reach the college football playoff, it would have had to have been Lamar Jackson that was going to have a great season, right? So what do I, how did I play that? I bet Louisville to win the ACC. I bet Louisville to reach the college football playoff. And I bet Louisville over their season win total. What, what didn't I do? I did not bet Lamar Jackson to win the Heisman at 100 to 1. So I'm a good handicapper and a terrible better. But please follow all the <laughs> bets that I make on this show. Uh, and we will do that right now. Let's recap. The wagers that you have made so far on this show, your four bear bets before we get to our best bet. And a little recap of things we might have missed here. You have Washington favored at home against Boise State minus the 14 year lane there. I that, love them this that, game. I, the number's just the numbers too low. I, I'm with you. Again, I despise Washington. It's against my best interest, but they're going to be Boise State here. As much as Boise State's confident they can shut them down, they're just not. South Alabama on the road, 10 win team from last season, getting six and a half points against a Tulane team coming off a con ball, but losing a lot of that production that we saw last season that helped them beat USC in that game. Middle Tennessee at Alabama, Middle Tennessee plus the 39 points. That's more of an of a anti Alabama wager with their quarterback situation, maybe being vanilla before Texas than is maybe a, a pro middle Tennessee wager there. And the last one here, PU, Purdue, minus three and a half hosting <laughs> Fresno State. The line movement there, Bear, uh, has you interested in laying that three and a half with Purdue. Both teams with new quarterbacks. A lot of fun to watch that game this weekend. Before we get to our best bets, I have one, you have one. One game we touched on a little bit earlier in our in, in our gambling group chat is the biggest game of the weekend. It's two ranked teams, LSU, Florida State. Um, I don't know if we have wagers on this game, Bear, but I have a strong feeling on which way I would go if asked about it. And I'm going to tell you right now, I think it's Florida State. Um, I think Florida State's better in the offensive defense aligns than LSU. Those question marks in LSU's back end of their secondary, a lot of transfer mm-hmm. portal players there. We know what Jordan Travis can do at quarterback at Florida State. And he has some big wide receiving weapons as well. I think it's a very close win, man, but I would lay the points um, uh, with uh, with Florida State here at plus two and a half. We'll take the points. Take, take the points, Florida State. Take, yeah, take the points, yeah. yeah, yeah the I, points, think, yes. I, I think Johnny Johnny Wilson and, and Keon, like one of the bigger transfer portal deals that was late was Keon Coleman coming in from Michigan State to Florida State. So, yeah, I, I would take the points with Florida State if I had to play that game. And maybe by kickoff, maybe I'll decide to do it. There's, there's, an, there's another game out there. And I'm going to dub like my bear trap game of the week. And why in the world is Texas Tech going to Laramie 
to play Wyoming. You're a 14 point favorite. It, you're supposed it's a no win situation. If you win, you're supposed to win. Congratulations. If you lose, it's like the end of the world. Why, why did you play the game? Going into this the, Wyoming with a great defense, with like nine guys back on, on the defensive side of the ball, a well coached team by Craig Bull. Like, you know, you are going up there and you are going to get in a rock fight. You've got Oregon next week as well. So you know that the Texas Tech players are already thinking about their home opener with, with your Ducks coming in. To, in. So like, I don't know if Wyoming can score enough points to pull the upset. But that is just a game that I am going to be monitoring. And just, it would not surprise me at all to look up in the fourth quarter and see this game be like 17-13 Texas Tech. I would just hate for Texas Tech to get really beat up in that altitude before coming home to, to face Oregon. That would, that would, that <laughs> sure would absolutely would. stink. A lot of people are on Texas Tech against Oregon in week two, by the way. It's kind of frustrating already. Like, I think, the, I think people the, are the, doubting. The Tyler Shuck ball, team. right? The Tyler Shuck ball, yes. Right? Yeah, he, he couldn't beat out Anthony Brown. Now he's at Texas Tech. Um, all right, Bear. <laughs> Let's get to our best bets. We're going to have a friendly contest this season between us to see who ends up with the crown of winning the most best bets this year. Again, these are wagers that we have made uh, and we are heavy into. I know I am for mine. I think you are as well. What's your best bet of the week? I'm looking at the TCU team total over 41 and a half against Colorado. We kind of eviscerated Colorado's roster and Sammy P went into detail as to some of the problems that they have on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, their defensive line, I think, is going to struggle. I think they have issues in the secondary as well. I think the, I think the TCU wide receiver room has caught the eye of the Colorado defensive coaching staff, and, and I think they're kind of reevaluating what they're going to do <laughs> on both sides of the ball because I think there was some reports that Travis Hunter was going to play wide receiver, and I think now he might be playing – Defensive back now instead, so it, it has a wide range of effect on the uh, on the Colorado game plan here. So I, there were people last year that thought Chandler Morris was better than Max Duggan, and he should have been the guy. And then Duggan took took over uh, for 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 Morris after he got hurt in that Colorado game. So yes, they lost Quinton Johnson and a bunch of other offensive weapons. I think the wide receiver room with with, uh, with JP Richardson coming in from Oklahoma State, and some other guys, I think they're going to be fine and they're going to put up a bunch of points. I, I just we, we talked before about how team playing together, knowing where guys are going to be. That's not the case with Colorado. You got a bunch of new guys who didn't even play together in the spring, and now you're going on the road yeah. in 100 degree heat, facing that offense, and coming off of a, an embarrassing loss in the national championship game. They're going to they're going to be out to put up whatever number they can. I think a game. I think in the 50s is a is a is a very good possibility here. So I am. Uh, I'm going TCU over 41 and a half is my best bet. I think it's important to note, and I think Sammy mentioned this, you better mentioned this earlier as well, is that teams are going to try to run the score up on Colorado the entire season, right? It's just the nature of the program that that Dion is building in Colorado. He's he's very loud. He's very in your face. He's very boisterous. He's getting he's he's yelling about recruits coming to him all the time. Like those are good things for the Colorado program. They're great to build that program. However opposing coaching staffs view that as a negative, right? That he's hogging their attention, that he's talking before he's winning, and they're going to try to score as many points and win by as many points as possible each and every week until Colorado obviously is good enough to compete against those teams. So if TCU's up, you know, uh, of uh, uh, 37 to 7 in the fourth quarter, they're going to try to score again, Bear, and score again and and score again and score again. Well, I gave my best bet. Yes. What, what, what's your best bet? I'm gonna I'm gonna toot my horn for a second. Everyone knows your credentials, right? You are the bear. You're you're Chris Felicia. Oh. You're the bear. You've been on television for so many years. ESPN.com. I'm glad you're here I'm now. Sorry for that. It's, awesome. it's fantastic. It's great. You 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 won for so many years. What I do best is wager on the Pac-12. I do Pac-12 radio. It's been my job for you five do. years now. I'm very good at wagering the Pac-12. I'm going to give you a Pac-12 wager each and every weekend. You may not like it, but I'm going to win you a lot of money. I'm, I'm going first to a game that no one's going to watch. I do not care. It's on 7 o'clock on Saturday on CBS Sports Network. Take a peek at it. It's Washington State at Colorado State. I have the under here of 54 and a half. This is ticked down a little bit from about 57. But Colorado State last season, guys, average, what I have right here. 13.2 points per game, um, and they returned most of their offense from last year. You can make the case, obviously, they'll get a little bit better. But what does Wazoo do best? 
They play defense. They're a fantastic defensive team. And last season, they dominated, dominated bad offenses when when when, when they had a chance. On the flip side, Colorado State's defense last year only allowed four point eight yards per play. They were great last year. Washington State returns Cam Ward. I get that, Bear, but they have a new offensive coordinator, a new offensive line, an entire new wide receiver room as well. I think they struggle on offense in this game. They didn't play very well on the road last season as, as well. I like the under here. I think this game could be like 20 to 17 and cash pretty easy. Yeah, CSU, I think, has one of the better wide receivers in the league and one of the better def defensive linemen in the league as well. But they were decimated by injuries to that quarterback position. I think Norvell inherited a mess uh, from the Adazio era. So I, I would look for some improvement from CSU this year. One question, though, about, about Washington State as it relates to the Pac-4, formerly the Pac-12, do you think there will be any effect on the field for Stanford Cal Oregon State Wazoo, like we're we're the last four standing. What what is what are we going to be looking like next year and the years coming? Are we going to be worrying about players leaving? What, uh, coaches, do I want to coach here? Like, do you think any of that's going to kind of seep through to like on the field performance and maybe preparation in some of these games? Might 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 those four teams be fade candidates early on, or might it be a situation where it kind of galvanizes? A locker room and, and a team and be hey nobody wants us we're, we're going to show them you probably should want us or better yet you're not going to want us because we're going to beat you i don't think so um i think it will matter for recruiting which has, doesn't matter for this upcoming season right and, and, and it might matter for the longevity of the coaches i think the one team it, it, it would affect the most is oregon state whose coach is fabulous jonathan smith is an outstanding football coach mm -hmm. and if they cannot afford to pay him and they just gave him a new extension which he definitely deserves took it from a, a two-win team to a 10-win team bear he's gone after the season like he's absolutely gone out of Oregon. he doesn't want to leave he again he played there like he's an, an oregon state guy he built that program up from two wins to 10 wins last season but if they go to the mountain west man he's not staying he's not staying in the mountain west and so i think that <laughs> that that is the concern for oregon state I don't think a concern for Washington State. Obviously, Stanford has a, has a new coach. I can see Wilcox at Cal wanting to get out of Cal if they end up going to the ACC. He's a really good football coach as well, but he's going to end up moving to the SEC or the Big Ten, who obviously have giant conferences as well. So I think Oregon State, for me, in the offseason – is the biggest concern for program changing because their coach doesn't want to coach a Mountain West. Well, I think we've covered a lot. It's not the, the, the most competitive opening week of the college football season. I think we have, uh, I have a number here, the 17 ranked opponents that are facing a non unranked FBS opponent, only two are favored by fewer than 13 points. You've got 10 teams favored by at least 24, seven favored by at least 30. And that doesn't even include the five ranked opponents that are facing FCS opponents. So I think this week is kind of the, uh, the appetizer for next week when we have a bunch of really good games. So week one is going to be fantastic. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, Will. Hopefully we gave you a lot of uh, actionable information there. So next week we'll be back Thursday. Big noon kickoff offense, Bear Bets, the college version, again on Thursday. And then week one of the NFL, which I can't wait for week one of the NFL. I, I am a survivor junkie. Like, survivor oh, yeah. in, the, in the NFL <laughs> is, like, my favorite thing going. So I, I think we're going to have to have, like, an, a, a weekly survivor type segment as well. I'm, I'm already, like, my mind is, college football is going to be great this week, but I'm already immersed in, do I want to take Washington in week one against Arizona, or do I want to go the game theory route and avoid that and hope that the entire pool gets wiped out because, you know, everybody's <laughs> going to take the commanders week one. Take the commanders. They're going to beat the Cardinals. Do it. Um, that's all we got for the, the first edition. We had a lot of fun. Remember, download, subscribe, rate, review, wherever you get all your podcasts. And as always, remember, the less you bet, the more you lose when you win. <laughs>